True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The stillness of the Cape Town night is disturbed for just a moment by the splash that's made in the river. The killer stands and watches as the plastic sheeting bobs for just a minute and then starts to sink. Then the surface is still again. It's like it never happened. And the killer is very happy to pretend it didn't. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 104, The Murder of Graham Chatburn. Hey, True Crime South Africa listeners. I'd like to tell you about a brand new South African podcast called Your Mom with Skulk. I love how the podcast landscape in South Africa is expanding, and I'm really pleased to be a part of that. The content in True Crime South Africa's episodes can be a little bit heavy, though, so I think it makes complete sense to balance that out with some light-hearted fun. Skulk Bezaden Hoet is genuinely one of my favorite comedians and personalities, and now he has his own podcast. Hello there, all you crime junkies, you sickos. It's Skulk Bezaden Hoet here. I'm sorry to interrupt the murder or the robbery or whatever heinous crime Nicole is telling you about, but I just wanted to tell you quickly about a new podcast that I'm hosting called Your Mom with Skulk. Hello, Minsa, and welcome to Your Mom with Skulk, a brand new podcast by Telltale Media, hosted by me, Skulk Beside Note. Now, on this show, we're going to journey deep into the lives of really lucky people. Some of them are my friends. Some of them I wish were my friends. But I don't want to speak to these exceptional people, these celebrities directly. I mean, here, look at Minsa. I think we are all so tired of listening to celebrities. Everyone and their mother, excuse the pun, has a podcast where they interview celebrities. So we're not going to speak to the celebrities directly, but rather about the celebrities through the people that know them better than anyone, which is, of course, their mothers. I am sitting here, Minsa, in the house of Tani Gale Goliath. I am sitting in the house of Jack Barrow, Bertus Basson, Simone Pretorius, and a ongelooflike maat, Tani Tinky. Le Klaus. Le Klaus. Le Klaus. Oh, sorry, my bad. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> the woman of the hour for me is... The Queen. The Queen. It was my favorite words of f***ing f***ing, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for the journalist to hear that. This is who I want to speak to. Their mothers. Your favorite word is f- but you don't like tattoos. Nee, f***. Dit is nou rechtig die einde. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or check us out at telltale.media forward slash skulk. I mean, it would be a crime not to... Anyway, back to you, Nicole. Donkey. I highly recommend you go follow Skulk's podcast right now on whatever platform you're listening on. Now, let's get back to the show. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank a few people who've supported the show through Patreon recently. A huge thank you goes out to Angelique Fenter, Maxine, Angelique Nongazu, Tyler Hack. Makozaza Kanyile, and Monique Timmerman. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. The case I'm covering today is quite old. It's from 1992. So not as old as me, but close. But it's all still extremely relevant and it's been requested quite a few times. I think the interest in this case comes predominantly from it being a female murderer. People are always fascinated by that, and you know how I love to blow the myths around female killers out of the water. 
equality in all aspects, and all that. I also think the ongoing interest in this case comes from all the unanswered questions. And really, there hardly ever is a case in which all of the questions are answered by the time the judge's gavel drops. But in this one, it really does seem that someone may have got away with murder. In researching this episode, I used an excerpt from Mickey Pistorius' book, Fatal Females, an episode of Heiskenort Waren Levensdramas, and several media articles. So let's get into episode 104, The Murder of Graham Chatburn. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Graham Chatburn grew up in a family of five siblings, of which he was the oldest. His brother Noel says that he was the most lovable and caring older brother he could have wished for. And although they grew up very poor, almost all of his best memories of his childhood revolve around his oldest brother. When Graham left school, he, like many young men at the time, joined the railways, and he would stay in this industry for most of his adult life. Also, like many other young men, Graham married young. He met and married his first wife almost straight out of school, and had two children from the marriage. Sadly, that marriage did not last, and he remarried not long after his divorce from his first wife, and had another three children with his second wife. The daughter he had from this marriage, Jennifer, shares some fond memories of her dad with the producers of Heiskenort Vare Levensdramas. She says that her dad was a huge joker, and would often have them in stitches, but he also had a really soft side. She recalls sitting and watching movies with him, and if the scene was particularly emotional, she would look over to find her dad with a blanket over his face. He was trying to hide the fact that he was crying. Sadly, she also says that she didn't really get to see much of her dad growing up because his work on the railways meant he was often working 16 to 18 hour shifts. Her mom would sometimes take the children up to the railway office to see their dad while he worked, but it soon became clear that Graham's long work hours were having a negative impact on his marriage. And when Jennifer was in matric, her mother and father divorced. Graham had always been a regular churchgoer, but after his divorce he started going much more often and soon became a trusted member of the congregation, who the pastor looked to to welcome new congregants and those experiencing difficulties in their lives. Graham and Jennifer shared a flat for a while, and Jennifer jokes that although she did her best to cook for her dad, she often found takeaway receipts in his pockets, and she acknowledges that she hadn't been the greatest cook. This time in their lives was really quite special to Jennifer, because it was the first time she was really spending a good amount of time with her dad, and she really was enjoying getting to know him. It wasn't long after they'd moved in together, though, that Graham started to mention the name of a woman he'd met at church, and it soon became clear that this woman was fast becoming much more than a friend. When Louisa de Toy had first started coming to the church that Graham attended, she'd been introduced to him as a new congregant and someone who was going through a really rough time. The 30-year-old woman had recently become a widow when her husband of 12 years had taken his own life and she'd started attending the church as a way of finding support and healing, she said. Louisa de Toy was born Louisa Griffith, the only child of her parents in Kimberley in the Northern Cape. When Louisa was four months old, her mother deserted her and her father. Her father allegedly neglected Louisa so badly that she ended up being placed with her grandparents. As soon as she matriculated, She married Farnie de Toy, and they would end up having two daughters together. Louisa and Farnie were married for 12 years, when on the 30th of July 1989, 
the man took his own life with a gun registered to Louisa. A full inquest was held into his death, and it was ruled as a suicide. Louisa started attending church and met Graham Chatburn, and she was immediately attracted to him. Jennifer describes her father as having been quite a catch. She said he was friendly, well-spoken, kind, and took incredible care of his appearance. She could completely understand why Louisa would have been drawn to him, but she and many other members of the family felt that the relationship had moved far too quickly. Graham was also 17 years older than Louisa, and although that didn't seem like an issue for the couple, Graham's children did seem quite uncomfortable with having such a young stepmother. Jennifer acknowledges, though, that Louisa was a very attractive woman, and she went out of her way to dress in eye-catching outfits. Within four months of meeting, Louisa and Graham were married. His family were shocked both at the suddenness of the event, which they hadn't really known was going to happen, and also at the fact that Louisa didn't seem to have taken any time at all to grieve for her first husband. She'd been married to Farney for 12 years, had two children with him, and suicide is a particularly traumatic way to lose a loved one. Those who cared for Graham were concerned that the woman was jumping into the marriage without first having processed her loss. But the couple were adamant. They moved into a house together in Cryfontaine, and Jennifer, around that time, had also met and married her husband, so she was off doing her own thing and didn't really pay much more attention to her father's new wife. The concerns that Graham's family had soon manifested themselves, though, and within a year of their marriage, Graham and Louisa divorced. Then they were back together again and married again. It was all a bit confusing for those around them, but they just hoped that Graham was happy. That, after all, was what really mattered. The third child that Graham had had with his second wife, Jennifer's mom, was quite a lot lamaki, and he was still in high school when his parents divorced. The young man struggled significantly, and eventually when Jennifer married, she invited him to come and stay with her and her husband. When he moved in, she began to realise that the boy's schooling costs were quite significant, and it became a serious burden on her and her husband. Her mother was unable to contribute as she herself was struggling after the divorce, so Jennifer turned to her father. The request, however, was not received in the way she'd hoped. Graham said he actually didn't have anything to give her at that point. Jennifer pushed back, saying that he was supporting Louisa, so why could he not support his own son? The argument went back and forth, with Graham acknowledging he needed to contribute, but never seeming to come up with the money. Then, on the evening of the 15th of February 1992, Jennifer phoned her father and became more than a little angry on the phone. Father and daughter argued, and he eventually told her he was getting paid out part of his pension from the railway in the next few weeks, and he would give her a bulk amount from that to cover costs for her brother. Although this was hopeful, Jennifer was still angry that she'd had to push her father like that, and ended up slamming the phone down in his ear. As she sat in her home, her angry words still burning in her ears, she immediately felt bad about how she'd behaved toward her father. He was in the wrong, but she felt she'd behaved disrespectfully, and she thought about phoning him back to apologise. She didn't, though, and instead she spent the night tossing and turning, promising herself that she would call her father in the morning and smooth things over. Jennifer would sadly not get that chance, though as before she could make any calls on the 16th of February, she received a call from her uncle. He told her that her father had gone out for a walk that morning, and he hadn't come home. 
Louisa had reported him missing late that afternoon, and her uncle, who lived close by to Graham, gathered up some friends and went to search. They knew Graham enjoyed walking on the nearby school fields, which led into a park area, so that's where they started. They searched long into the dark that night, but there was no sign of Graham. Jennifer says that she was beside herself. Louisa had said her father had gone to walk after having a restless night following their argument. She felt even more guilty at that moment for having fought with her father. Jennifer lived in Pretoria and felt completely helpless. She was sure that at any minute she'd get the call that her father had come home safe and sound and she'd be able to apologise to him for their argument. She said that in the days after her father's disappearance, she felt like she was playing phone ping-pong. She bounced calls between her uncle and her grandmother asking, Have you heard anything? Each time the answer was, No, nothing yet. The search continued in Cryfontaine and surrounds into the 17th and 18th, but not a single lead was uncovered. There are, of course, a limited number of avenues that can be investigated in a situation like this. Graham Chatburn was an adult male. He hadn't had any serious health issues, although Louisa had claimed that after his argument with his daughter, he'd had a mild asthma attack. He'd seemingly left the house of his own volition and hadn't told Louisa where he was going to walk, so the possibilities were almost endless. The argument with Jennifer also presented the possibility that Graham may have simply gone to cool down. In fact, his daughter at one point thought perhaps that he was on his way to Pretoria to see her. She half expected him to walk in the door at any moment, but that never happened. In the meantime, on the 18th of February 1992, a municipal worker cleaning refuse away from the banks of the Lisbiak River, which runs through several Cape Town suburbs, spotted a bundle of plastic floating in the water. The man hooked his stick onto the bundle and pulled it to the shore, and to his horror, found a human body inside. The body found in the river was clearly that of a male, but February was a relatively hot month, and being in the water had caused the body to start decomposing. One of the hallmarks of a body disposed in water, or someone who's drowned, is bloating of the body, as well as discoloration of the skin, which would make identification extremely difficult. There was one very peculiar thing about the victim, though, which added to him having been wrapped in plastic sheeting, also proved that this was quite clearly a murder. The victim had been shot through the head with a crossbow bolt, and the bolt was still in the man's head. The man was also completely naked, save for a pair of boxer shorts. The body was retrieved, and initial assumptions were that this was perhaps a member of the local Chinese mafia, who'd been involved in the shark fin trade and been killed by his fellow mafia members. In fact, when the find was broadcast on the on radio stations later that day, this is exactly the story that accompanied it. Graham's family heard about the recovery, but didn't think much of it at all. After all, the reports had said that the body of a Chinese man had been recovered, and that it was linked to organised crime. That had nothing to do with Graham. The forensic pathologist that did the autopsy on the body, though, soon blew away the Chinese mafia theory. He noticed that although the victim's skin was discoloured in most places, in the very corners of his eyes and the very corners of his mouth, the skin there had been protected, and that skin was pale. When speaking to Heiskenwood Vara Levenstramers, the pathologist explains how he was trying to turn over the victim's body when he grabbed one of the man's hands, and the skin on his hand came away in an almost complete glove form. It's extremely difficult to take fingerprints from a very decomposed body because the tissue begins to liquefy and break down, and getting an accurate print is almost impossible. 
but this other process of decomposition, skin slippage, which occurs when the bonds between the dermis and the epidermis break down, the pathologist saw as an opportunity to possibly get some usable prints. What the man did is now quite commonly practiced when bodies are decomposed, but this may well have been one of the first times it was ever done in a South African mortuary. He placed the slipped skin over his gloved hand and realized that he was essentially wearing the victim's fingerprints. He excitedly called for a fingerprint technician and photographer, and sure enough, they were able to get almost perfect prints off the slipped skin of the victim's right hand, while the pathologist wore it like a glove. Now, I know for most people this sounds really gross. And really, yes it is. It's a horrible thought that one day your skin may slip off your body like that. And I'm sure it's definitely not a nice thing for the family members of the victim to hear about either. But every time I hear about this being done, I cannot help but think about what a beautiful act this actually is. I know, I'm strange, but bear with me. Unidentified victims, in addition to losing their lives, have lost the one thing that connects them with the world, with those they love, and really, with their entire identity, their name. Your name is just a label, after all, but it holds tremendous significance when you no longer have it, or when someone else doesn't know what your name is and you can no longer speak for yourself. An unidentified victim is not likely to get justice if they're murdered, because the entire premise of crime investigation is beginning with the victimology. And you can't have an idea of victimology if you don't know who the victim is. Our fingerprints are one of the parts of our body that are 100% that are unique to us. No one else in the world, okay, the odds are minuscule, will have the same walls and ridges as you. So this act of this complete stranger, this mortuary assistant or pathologist, who doesn't know you from a bar of soap and has no reason to go any further than just doing the basics of an autopsy. Folding the tissue that once belonged to a living human being over their own living hand, in the hopes that they can bring your memory back to life and give back your name. I don't know. I just think it's such an act of grace and compassion. It's like the living holding hands with the dead for just a moment, saying, I've got this. We'll find out who you are and give you your name back. Yeah, I know I'm a weirdo, but you're listening to the weirdo after all, so there's that. The fingerprints yielded from that autopsy did provide results. After being submitted to Home Affairs, the investigating officer assigned to the case received a name. The body in the Lispiak River, with a crossbow bolt through the skull, was 49-year-old Graham Chatburn. The I.O. was in a different jurisdiction to where Graham's missing persons report had been made, so he didn't immediately pin the two together but he did get Graham's address from his marriage certificate when he'd married Louisa, and he drove out to the house in Cryfontaine. Graham's parents had come to stay with Louisa after Graham had gone missing. They'd cooked for her and cleaned for her, and generally tried to make things easier on the woman during such a difficult period. They were there the day that the police investigator arrived to break the news to Louisa that Graham's body had been found. Jennifer recalls how she heard that her father was dead. She called her grandmother and asked, as she had so many times in the days prior, if she'd heard anything. 
The devastated older woman could only get out one sentence before she dropped the phone. Your father is dead. Jennifer was inconsolable. She still believed that her father had gone out for a walk to clear his mind after their arguments, and he'd clearly crossed paths with the madman who'd taken his life. Racked with guilt, she got into her car with her mother and drove the 1,200 kilometres to Cape Town. As detectives attempted to uncover any motive for Graham's murder, they, as is standard practice, started with the person closest to him, his wife, Louisa. She said that although they divorced and remarried, they were now very happy together, and she had no idea who had once her husband dead. In a search of Graham's car, Police found paperwork in the back seat which related to a life insurance policy which had been taken out to insure his life. This paperwork was bagged as possible evidence. The strange method of killing would be both a blessing and curse to investigators. There was no ballistics, no way of searching a database for a possible weapon to match up to, but the uncommon nature of the weapon itself meant that if they found someone with such a weapon, or with access to a crossbow, close to Graham, there was a good chance they'd be close to his killer. The weapon in question, though, would not be found by police. Instead, it was found by a father and son walking through a park in Cryfontein. The pair found the crossbow dumped in long grass, and recognising it as a dangerous weapon, took it to the closest police station. Of course, there was a very good chance that this was linked to Graham's murder, considering the location and the fact that one didn't see crossbow murders or crossbows dumped in parks every day. So the I.O. set about visiting every crossbow supplier in the area, showing them a picture of the weapon and asking if they recognised it. And sure enough... One did. They'd sold it from their store in December 1991, two months before Graham's murder. The store owner remembered that the person who'd bought it was a woman. He remembered that because his clientele weren't commonly female, and this one was quite attractive, he recalled, and a little flirty. When the I.O. showed the man a picture of Louisa Chatburn, he confirmed that it was indeed the same woman who'd purchased that crossbow from him. Just nine days after Graham Chatburn went missing, his wife Louisa was taken into custody on charges of murder. His family was initially only told that a suspect had been arrested, and when they discovered that it was Louisa, they were completely horrified. His parents could not believe that the woman could be involved in their son's murder. They had lived with her in their house for the past week, cared for her, cleaned for her, and she'd seemed just as bereft as them at the news of Graham's murder. Jennifer was seething. When Graham had disappeared, Louisa had been sure to emphasise how upset Graham had been about the argument with his daughter. Jennifer had even phoned Louisa to apologise for having possibly played a role in her father's disappearance and death. And the woman had continued to let Jennifer believe this. Louisa was charged with Graham's murder and appeared in court, and she was then released on bail. While out on bail, she did an interview with Heskenuit magazine. The interview was bizarre. The woman arrived at the location with several outfit changes and insisted on changing during the interview so that the photographer could take pictures of her. What should have been the story of a grieving widow, perhaps pictured on the couch in her home with a tear-stained face, became a full-on photo shoot. Louisa preened and posed for the camera, and she wasn't alone. With her was a man she said had supported her after Graham's disappearance, and who she saw as a dear friend. For two people who'd allegedly only known each other for nine days, though, the pair seemed very close. The man whose first name was Gerard, 
was married. He called himself an evangelist, and Louisa said he'd been sent by the church to assist her. But things just didn't add up for those watching the pair. In the photo shoots, Louisa drapes herself against Gerard. She sits on the floor next to him and rests her head on his knee. There was also talk that when they drove to the courthouse, Gerard's wife came with, but she would sit in the back seat while Louisa and Gerard sat up front. Almost from the first moments that Louisa became a suspect, police did not believe she could have committed the crime alone. The crossbow took a lot of strength to load, and Graham's body would have had to have been transported. Initially, Louisa denied any involvement in her husband's murder. Then, she admitted that yes, she had been present when he died. According to her, Graham had asked her to buy the crossbow the previous December. She'd given it to him and hadn't seen it since then. But in the early hours of the 16th of December, she'd come downstairs to the kitchen to find Graham standing there with the crossbow in his hand. She said he had a strange look in his eyes, and she immediately thought about her previous husband who'd taken his own life. She lunged at Graham and tried to grab the crossbow from him, but in the struggle she'd accidentally touched the trigger and the bolt had fired into Graham's head. She said she'd been so scared that all she could think about was getting rid of his body, so she rolled him up in plastic and then put his body in the car. She'd driven down to the Lispiak River and dumped him in the water. When forensics teams scoured the Chatburn's house, though, they found no trace of blood in the kitchen. The only place they did find blood was in the bedroom that Louisa and Graham had shared. When Louisa's trial started, she decided to plead not guilty of the murder of her husband, but when her plea explanation was delivered, it contained an entirely different scenario than the one she'd given police. Now, Louisa didn't claim her husband's death was an accident. She admitted she had intentionally shot him, but she said she'd only done so because he was sexually abusing her, as she claimed he had done for all the time she had known him and she had eventually snapped on the evening of the 15th of December when she claims Graham had tried to rape her in their bed. She had retrieved the crossbow and killed him. Now it seemed clear to the prosecutor at least that this change in story had come as a result of the evidence that Graham's blood was only found in the bedroom. They believed that Louise had realised her accident in the kitchen story was not going to fly. So she changed it up, and perhaps she thought if she claimed her husband was sexually abusive, she could avoid jail time altogether. Jennifer explains how difficult it was to sit in the court and listen to the lies being told about her father. She says she felt helpless because no one actually knew her dad, but at least her brother and uncle would be allowed to speak about the impact of the crime on her family and portray, even in some small way, what their dad was actually like as a person. The prosecutor told the judge that Louisa Chatburn was a manipulative woman who had lured Graham into marriage after her first husband died and she was left penniless. In Graham, the prosecutor said, Louisa saw a stable man with a good income. But according to him, she tired of him quickly, and they believed she'd also started another relationship. The man named Gerard, they said, was not just someone who'd come along after Graham's death to comfort her. They believed that he'd been the other participant in the murder. A woman who'd known Gerard for many years testified that she'd overheard a conversation between Gerard and Louisa about the night of the murder, and the pair had said that the plan had been for him to hide in the bathroom of the Chatburn's house while Louisa killed Graham and then help the woman to dispose of his body. Louisa insisted she'd committed the crime on her own, but when asked to replicate the actions of loading the bolt into the crossbow as well as lifting a dead weight, the same as her husband's body, into a vehicle, she was unable to do so. 
Throughout the trial, a replica of the skull with a crossbow bolt through it stood on the prosecutor's desk, underpinning the brutality of what Graham had experienced. And if that was not enough, the pathologist would testify that results from the autopsy indicated that it was likely Graham was not dead when he was dumped into the river. The prosecutor said that Louisa Chatburn was very clearly only telling part of the truth about her husband's murder, and there was no evidence that she'd been sexually abused by him. His two previous wives both testified that they'd never experienced any sexual abuse from Graham, and they'd both been married to him far longer than Louisa. The real motive was likely a combination of a love triangle and a financial motive. Perhaps Graham was getting ready to divorce Louisa again, this time for good. And perhaps she decided that this just wouldn't do. I also have to wonder about the conversation that Jennifer had with her dad that night. He told her on the phone that he was going to be getting part of his pension payout in the next few weeks, and that he was going to give a chunk of it to her to help care for her little brother. Had Louisa heard this, and decided that Graham's children were not going to eat into her nest egg. The fact that she'd purchased the crossbow in December 91, and there was no proof that Graham had actually asked her to do so, meant that the murder was likely premeditated. Perhaps she'd planned to do it after Graham's pension paid out, but when she heard what he planned to do with the money, she had to move the timeline of her murder up. The judge would eventually find Louisa guilty of the murder of Graham Chatburn. Louisa, who had remained completely emotionless throughout the trial, only broke down once, and that was when she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. The judge said he believed the murder was premeditated from at least December 1991, if not before that. He also said he didn't believe she'd committed the crime on her own, and that she was clearly covering up for someone. That someone, he said, was very possibly Gerard, but his wife had given him an alibi, and he therefore could not be charged. As Louisa sat shaking her head in disbelief, she was ordered to start serving her sentence immediately at the female centre at Polsmore Prison. Although Jennifer now knew that her argument with her father had not directly led to his death, it didn't ease the guilt she felt for having had the last word she'd had with her father being ones of anger. She explained that it took a very long time to start slowly coming to terms with the decision she'd faced. She realized that she could either sit in her misery and be eaten up by the anger she felt toward Louisa, or she could make sure that her father's death would not be in vain. Jennifer would go on to work in restorative justice. She qualified as a criminologist and now works with an organization to help both victims and their families, as well as perpetrators, find some middle ground and be able to move forward with their lives. For some perpetrators, this happens when they're paroled and for others they undertake the program while still incarcerated to help them properly rehabilitate and answer the unanswered questions from their victims, which so often plague them. For Jennifer, this work has been the process of healing from her father's murder too. She wanted all the answers, and eventually had to accept that she will probably never know exactly why and precisely who was involved but by helping others to achieve their own level of restorative justice, she's achieved some sense of that herself. After several instances of denied parole, Louisa Chatburn was granted release from Polsmore Prison in 2007. She was given a set of parole conditions she had to abide by until her sentence would expire in 2015. A few months after it expired, she married for the third time. She'd met Hein Bruhen while serving her sentence in Polsmore, and the pair remained married until November 2017, 
when Hein suddenly became ill and passed away soon after. Now, I'm not going to gloss over this. I know what you're thinking, and yes, it crossed my mind too. But the articles about Bruhin's death do say he passed away from cancer. And it's not uncommon for very aggressive cancers to immediately debilitate and quickly kill people. It is clear, though, that many people felt his death was suspicious, and they mentioned that Hein had been working one day and on his deathbed the next. In the wake of Graham's murder, Louisa's first husband's death had been raised again and questioned, but an inquest was held into that man's death too, and it was ruled a suicide. It seems very likely that at least one person escaped justice around this crime. I did consider that adrenaline can provide people with strength beyond their normal means, and perhaps this was how Louisa managed to load the crossbow and move Graham's body on her own. But I just don't think it flies. There's too much leaning towards this Herat gentleman having been involved with Louisa to some extent. This evidence includes two more things that would be revealed after the trial was complete. The first was that Herat was an avid collector of crossbows. And the second was that, months after Louisa was jailed, the man met with a journalist and admitted that Louisa had actually killed Graham because he'd been sexually assaulting a teenager in their church congregation. Herod claimed that it was actually the teenager and Louisa who'd committed the crime together as revenge. Now this is an even further out there story than the one Louisa presented. I'm not saying that it's impossible for a 49-year-old man to one day wake up and become a sexual offender, but it's also pretty unlikely, especially if his alleged preferred victims are teenagers. Graham Chatburn had never been accused of any sexual impropriety throughout his life, and he had his own daughters, who'd also never seen any behavior like that, nor had either of his first two wives. Herat passed away while Louisa was serving her sentence in Palsmore, and he likely took the truth with him to his grave. I realized something while I was writing this episode. I kept referring to Louisa as Louisa Chatburn, and I realized how I was applying some pretty poor double standards. When I cover cases where men have killed their wives, and the female victims' families have indicated they prefer to refer to their deceased loved one by their maiden surname instead, I always honor that. I always say that the male perpetrator lost the right to have his wife bear his surname when he murdered her. But here, I've been doing exactly the opposite when the perpetrator is a female. In fact, I didn't even think about it until just now. I've never asked them, but I'm pretty sure Graham's family wouldn't want his murderer to bear his surname. So I'll correct that right now. Louisa Griffith, as she was born, very clearly committed the cold-blooded murder of her husband. She planned it down to the nth degree. But really, it was a combination of the little details and a whole lot of arrogance that would eventually prove her guilt. It's highly probable that Jennifer Chatburn would never have ventured into the line of work she did had it not been for her father's murder. And although I'm sure she would rather have her father back with her, the motive she set out with, to ensure that her father's death was not in vain, has undoubtedly been achieved. Don't get me wrong, the good she's done and continues to do does not justify Louisa's actions in any way. But hopefully, for Jennifer and her family, it brings some level of peace. A tiny plaster to tack together the gaping wound. As she trained in criminology and became used to seeing crime scene photographs, she felt the need to look at the photographs of her own father's body. It may seem counterintuitive to bring this level of horror into your own mind, 
Surely it's better just to remember the victim as they were. But for Jennifer, that wasn't so. She had built up an image in her head over the years that far outstripped the real horror, and so she knew that looking at those photographs, knowing the truth, would actually be healing for her. She now sometimes uses those pictures to show offenders the reality of what victims' families face. She says that so often these offenders don't realize what they've left people to find and how that picture in their head forever scars them. Often perpetrators will also minimize the horror in their own minds and it's important to remind them that what they did was horrendous and it was cruel and they are in prison for a very good reason. This is not to amplify their shame if they feel any, but rather to encourage them to connect with their victims' families should the families wish to, and understand why these people might still have such a level of anger toward them even decades later. For Jennifer, the pictures released her from a prison of her own. Her guilt and anger and all the unanswered questions had created a wall in her own mind, and seeing the reality, the truth of what Louisa Griffith did, helped her to start breaking down that wall. Now, she can remember her dad as who he was, rather than what was done to his body. She can remember Graham Chatburn, the father, the husband, the brother, and the hard-working man. She can remember all the things that his murderer can never take away. Graham Chatburn, rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 104, The Murder of Graham Chatburn. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Bye.